bacterial protein overexpression? Just the gist version. Basically, inside of this flask are lots and lots of bacteria that I've turned into factories for making a protein I want to study. Now, normally the bacteria wouldn't want to make this protein, and they don't even have the instructions for making the protein. So I give them those instructions in the form of a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid, in which I put those instructions for making this protein. And then I stick that pr plasmid into the bacteria. It's a process called transformation. And so then these bacteria have these plasmids. But this bacteria still have no interest in making my protein, which which is okay because I want them to just grow and not worry about making my protein, just grow and get lots and lots of bacteria copies. And then once there's a lot of them, I want them to make my protein. We call this induction when we get them to make our protein. And so the way that I got them to make my protein is by adding a chemical called IPTG. So IPTG mimics like lactose. And so that's a type of sugar and bacteria don't normally like to use lactose um, because they prefer to use glucose and things like this that are easier to break down and they don't have to make special enzymes to process them. So instead they only make lactose when there's not much glucose and when there's lactose present because why make the machinery for breaking down the lactose Lactose if there's no lactose around. But when there is lactose around and they don't have that glucose that they really like, well now they're going to start breaking down lactose. Um, but in order to do that, they've got to make all those enzymes for breaking down the lactose. So they have a way to know if there's lactose present. There's this thing called the lac operon, which is basically the set of genes that works together in order to make all the stuff that you need for lactose make breakdown. And so in front, part of that lac operon, like in front of it, controlling the whole thing, there's like this promoter and then like a repressor. Bottom line, they only make, when there's this lactose around, molecules kind of like unbind from the repressor and they bind to the promoter, and then the bacteria start making the protein. Well, those proteins for the lactose break down. Well, actually, they don't make those proteins. First, they have to actually make the, um, the messenger RNA for making those proteins. So the promoter is actually in front of the gene, uh, is controlling like RNA polymerase going and making a messenger RNA copy of that DNA. And then that gets um, translated by the ribosomes into making a protein. And so in order to make the protein, you first need to make the mRNA. And in order to make the mRNA, you've got to have the bacteria be like, oh, okay, well, this promoter says go and the repressor says, okay, no repression here. And so let's go and let's make those lactose making things. So now we've talked all the way about lactose, and now I'm going to tell you there's no lactose even involved in this story. Remember, we're using that lactose mimic, IPDG, because it's more stable and it's not going to like break down and then it's, yeah, all that stuff. So we use this IPTG instead of lactose. Okay, that's great. We've got one thing, but we've still been talking about this lac operon, and we don't care about that lac operon. We just want our protein made, and our protein's not part of that lac operon. So we trick the bacteria into thinking that it is. So we take that lac promoter, that thing that was in front of the lac operon, um, in front of all those lactose make breakdown genes. Instead of having them in front of the lactose make breakdown genes, we stick that promoter in front of our gene of interest. And now what's going to happen was the bacteria, they're like, oh, there's lactose around. And there's not even lactose around. It's IPTG. But that fools them into thinking there's lactose around. And then the lac having the lac promoter in front of our gene fools them into thinking that they're making something that they need to break down lactose. And then they really go and they make the messenger RNA for our protein. And then because there's a lot of that messenger RNA, the ribosomes are going to be like, hey, let's make some protein from that. And so you're going to get your protein made. And so that's the basics of when you do use a lac operon to express a protein of interest. So express is really just kind of like a word we use for make. So we're having the bacteria make lots of this protein for us. In fact, we're overexpressing the protein. So we're getting the bacteria to make tons and tons of it. And they make so much of it that they kind of stop doing anything else. They stop growing. They stop dividing. They just focus most of their attention on making our protein. And so we get them to overexpress this protein. Um, and we end up with lots of protein. But first, we got to let them grow. And so that's why we induce the expression at us later on. We don't just have them make the protein from the beginning because instead we want them to devote their energy to duplicating, so replicating, making lots of copies of themselves. And then when there's lots of copies of them, then we induce that expression. And so we monitor the growth of the bacteria by measuring something called the optical density or OD. Basically, the more bacteria there are in the solution, the less light can go through. And so if we measure how much light goes through, then we're going to be able to measure how much bacteria there 
there is there based on the bacterial cells kind of like scattering that the light. So we measure the OD, we find when they're in this kind of like phase where they're doubling and doubling and doubling and they're, but before they run out of nutrients and like plateau and then start dying. So we find that sweet spot, like that mid exponential range. And then we add the IPTG and convert these into protein making factories. And so I did that. And so hopefully in the morning, I will see that the bacteria have made lots of my protein. In fact, these bacteria, I made way, I was way too ambitious and I made a liter of media, but then the shaker would only hold the five, up to a 500 mil flask, but then the screws didn't work for that. So I'm, I'm now I'm in for doing 500 mils in four 125 mil flasks. So yeah, you gotta be really creative when you're working at a PUI, which is actually pretty fun. So yeah, if you want more details about the overexpression, I have much more on my blog and in the figures. Um, and I have a longer video on it as well. Note that sometimes we have the promoter in front of the T7 polymerase, and then we have a T7 polymerase promoter in front of our gene of interest. That's kind of like taking things to another level. You see, if, if you see like DE3 cells, they have this sort of system set up, like PET plasma, 28 plasmids, and things like this. Basically, this is a way in which it, the LAC operon, when you add the IPTG, it tells the cells to make the... Uh, protein called DNA or T7 polymerase. And that polymerase is one of those mRNA makers, but it's not the same one that the bacteria use for their own stuff. And so we get them to dedicate to all of that one, new one that we have them make to making a protein that we want by sticking the T7 promoter in front of our protein, a gene for the protein of interest. But it's not in front of anything else because it's this phage promoter. So it's basically this bacterial virus. And so the bacteria don't normally have this stuff, that promoter in front of their own genes. And so by putting it in front of the gene that we want, we're then able to use the T7 polymerase in front of instead of the bacterial polymerase, and so we don't have to compete with that bacterial one. So we get them to make even even more of it. And by having that like two layer security system, you can kind of prevent some leaky expression where things just kind of get made before you induce them. And so that's another way that you can use this lac operon is through having it having the lac promoter control the T7 polymerase and then the T7 polymerase promoter pr control your gene. And sometimes you get like a combination where you actually have like a T7 promoter and a lac repressor and um, promoter in front of your gene of interest. And so you can get extra, extra security to make sure that you're not getting things um, made when you don't want them if, to be made, like if your protein is toxic to the bacteria or something like that. So again, much more in other posts. This is just the gist.